Good morning and welcome to the Wuji webinar, How to Accelerate the Rate Limiting Step in Drug Discovery, the Synthesis of Target Molecules. This webinar is given by John Way. He's Vice President of Medicinal Chemistry of the Research Service Division, RSD, of Wuji Aptech. My name is Rich Saul. I'm head of the Cambridge office for Wuji Aptech and I'll be moderating this session. As we all know, drug discoveries are very risky business. Odds of success start from going from a project, the start of a project to commercial opportunity is on the order of 1%. It's very costly in, in, in terms of billions of molecules, of uh, dollars per molecule, and it's time consuming. It could be up to 20 years uh, from, from uh, conception to product. The hit to, the, uh, hit, to, uh, hit, to, hit to lead discovery and lead optimization phases of this process are on the order of three years. And with the average productivities of only several molecules per month, Per chemist, you know, it's been it's been identified that uh, um, you know the synthesis is a rate limiting step uh, for us, the chemists. So the question is, have you made the right molecules? Do you, does your chemistry allow for that? Did you get sufficient exploration of structure activity relationships? Were your yields sufficiently high for analoging and scale up? Were you perplexed by certain byproducts or lack of reactivity? Why did one kind of heterocycle behave differently than others? It's these kinds of results that have not been so well addressed in the past, but now through the efforts of John Way, we're gaining sufficient insights into what may seem like incomprehensible results. Our webinar fe features John Way. He's been evaluating novel ways to enable and increase productivity for synthetic chemists so that we may shorten uh, timelines. With the advent of more powerful computers and better computational algorithms, it's now been possible to evaluate the impact of desktop quantum mechanics into the understanding of reactions. John spent his industrial career at Merck, assuming, uh, assuming director level role in medicinal chemistry with a, a focus of various aspects of HIV drugs. He's a distinguished medicinal chemist and his contributions led to a centrist, the HIV integrase inhibitor, where he, and he received numerous awards that includes Merck's Basic Research Award and, and Recognition Award, American ACS Heroes of Chemistry Award, and the team received the Galien Pre Award, the equivalent of our Nobel Prize in our industry. Since John uh, came to uh, Wuji as uh, Vice President of Medicinal Chemistry, he's been appointed as Adjunct Professor of uh, Chemistry at Fudan University, and he's received the Wuji Technology Innovation Award. At the core of John's interests are ways that chemists can be more enabled for better decision making in synthetic and medicinal chemistry, hence his interest in uh, applications of machine learning and retrosynthesis. Uh, in today's topic, we'll be talking about how to accelerate the rate limiting step in drug development. But before we uh, go on and hand over to John, just want to give you a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, 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 please know that, the, that we are recording this webinar and it'll be available on our website in the coming days at rsd.wujiaptech.com. You'll also see uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, uh, let's see, the bottom of the screen, there's a, uh, there's a Q&A box. You can type in your questions. We'll try to uh, take them on as, uh, at the end of, the, uh, of this presentation. And so uh, with that, uh, I hand it over to John. John? Yes, thank you. This is John. And we should thank you for your kind introduction. And I will start. Uh, on the presentation. So synthesizing target continue to be the rate limiting step in drug discovery. To accelerate this rate limiting step requires to invest only on synthetic sequence in which each of the directions are most likely to work. How could we evaluate this in an objective, data-driven manner. To us, these questions become, could quantum mechanics, specifically fund the orbital calculation and analysis, could help us to rationalize and then predict reaction outcome, improve our productivity. Are the necessary software and hardware affordable to us to bench chemists. Now, 
key is what myself as a medicinal chemist need to know about fundy album theory. For electrophiles, we look at normal, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, as exemplified here by dichloro pyrimidine. Now, since there's no normal loop on C2 carbon, only on C4, as such, nucleophile will selectively attack on the core on the carbon with the chloride pointing down at the four position instead of at the two position. For nucleophile, we look at the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, as exemplified here by the enolate. And we know when we treat enolate, it will alkylate on the carbon and on the oxygen. Now, chemical reaction occur when this loop, HOMO and normal loop interact. They interact in many different ways. But if it lead to an irreversible event, in this case, a enolate reacting with this dichloropyrimidines with a loss of a coral group, that irreversible event is a chemical reaction. Now, calculating reaction itself, the reaction coordinate could be a very complicated business because we simply often at time do not know what that transition state is actually could be. The question could be for us is could we simplify our calculation by invoking Hammond possibly, which states that for exothermic reaction, that is for most of the useful reaction that we organic chemists are dealing with, they are exothermic. The transition state will resemble the reactants. That is to say, we are calculating a little bit simpler just the properties of the reactants and then extrapolate to make predictions. In the next few slides, I will use a few examples to illustrate this approach. Now, on this example, we have this angel lead on the right-hand side that is being made by a picket spangler reaction. If this indole lead structure is identified, we will try to make it analog and related error and had to error analog with the same reaction. Sometimes some of this substrate works, sometimes not with this pigment reaction, pigment spanker reaction. The question is, could we rationalize the difference and predict the future? Below here are the homo and the lumo of this indo mean in the middle, calculate in the same calculation. On the left-hand side of the lumo, we can see the loop spreading between red in color, spreading carbon two and three on the window ring. And then on the lumo side, we could see the loop corresponding on the yimi. And they are there, ready for potential cyclization to proceed. We also learn one thing, that is how regularly a reaction could proceed depends on the energy gap of the homo and the lumo. All this information that I just mentioned, after we draw the structure on the software, it could be generated in a few minutes in a relatively inexpensive desktop computer. Using 
the yin zhou intermediate as a reference, we can quickly understand why as the homo and normal energy gap increase, as we go up with this series of compounds, that we have to run the reaction at higher temperature and harsher conditions. With the yin dough at the bottom left, we can effect the cyclization in acidic acid at 90 degrees Celsius. With the benzoyl pyrosol, we have to effect it in TFA at 150 degrees Celsius. With the pyrosol all the way on the top, we could not, and we try, we try very hard, we could not get it to cyclize. So what we hear, seeing is a trend, and if we wait to quantify it. Now next is, we want to make this analog. What will we predict? Now yes, we try, we try very hard, the top compound, the phenolic compound, we couldn't get this one to cyclize. For the benzoyl valvin down there, it should work, but it didn't. Something is wrong with our analysis? No, not exactly. It's something to do with medicinal chemist's misconception of what is a better reaction conditions. So after we run through those analog on the left hand side, especially with the benzopyrazole, we thought and we call the TFA 150 degree Celsius the optimum conditions for this pectin reaction, and we use it on this benzoyl biofilm. Luckily. I'll also say, make very careful observation. She notes that LCMS indicates the presence of product in the beginning that is forming, but as the reaction proceeds, both starting material and product disappear. For me, this suggests to us that the desired product is forming, yet it decomposes in the very harsh conditions we are subjecting it to this molecule. Scaling it back to acidic acid and 90 degrees Celsius solved the problem. And we make the same mistake with the benzofurane and we recover from that. So in acidic acid, 90 degrees, we also can make the benzofurane analog effectively. For the acer indo analog, it is tricky because it is closer to the limit that we see with the train. We have to use TFA at 150 degrees Celsius. We couldn't get it to cyclize. The energy calculate or the energy gap calculate suggests this should be feasible. Then it becomes obvious to us that under this reaction condition, the purity nitrogen should be protonate. When we recalculate, we recognize the energy gap is way too high for the cyclization to proceed. Then, potential solution to this problem also become obvious. The corresponding refoxy and coral analogs should be less basic and we choose to proceed with the Mifoxy one because it is further down from the limit that we think about erections. And indeed, it works. Similar analysis were done with the benzimethyl analog. And we think this is also too high for it to cyclize. So we develop an alternative synthesis to make this analog. Example two is a nitration. 
They say need a hydrophilic reaction. So we assume they all proceed with the same electrophile in nitronium ion. For the substrate, we look at and calculate the homo energy. As we go down from the top left to the middle with all this green spot, the substrate becomes less electron rich. The homo energy number drop and we need harsher conditions for the nitration to proceed. Then, it but below 0.95 electron rho, under these conditions, we could not get the other substrate to nitrate. This observation are already analyzed and published Yet these numbers are very important for us to plan synthesis. We, we have a substrate close to this limit and need many steps to get to. It is very high risk for us to choose such sequence. We should evaluate alternative approach that avoid having this nitration at such a late stage. This type of analysis is applicable to inter or intramolecular reactions. Example three, where will we at? So the first two examples that I show you deal with where the direction will proceed. The following example deal with where the reaction will occur on the molecule. Now shown here is the substrate that we want to run a NCS coordination. Internally, it is not easy to predict with high confidence whether it will proceed at two position or three position or give us a mixture of products. We can calculate for the homo because this is a nucleophile. NCS is a electrophile. We can see the homo are spreading between carbon two and carbon three. Now, for situation in which it is localized on a specific carbon, then we know it will be selected on it. In this case, over the year, we learn another trick using quantum mechanics to calculate carbon-13 numbers, carbon-13 shift in the form of ppm. If the difference is more than six ppm, we learn that it's very likely we will have selective halogenation on the carbon with the lower chemical shift. In this case, carbon-3, and indeed, that is what we observe. A demo group at the University of Copenhagen also observed such correlation. But the empirical way the candle generate MMR number are less predictive, home for error. We prefer our approach, calculating homo and carbon-13 concurrently with quantum mechanics. Our ability to accurately predict this is critical for proper sequencing of serial metal catalyzed reactions and halogenations. For example, with a very structurally complicated molecule, if possible, we can start with a relatively accessible monohalogenated starting material, run a metal catalyzer coupled reaction, then able to predict with accuracy when we halogenate this resulting product where the halogen will go, and then run another parallel reaction repetitively 
zeroly in a highly predictive manner. We have designed and successfully executed sequences like this in many occasions. Example five, there are situations when the intrinsic properties of the compound and the intermediate are not compatible with the about strategy. Say so we have to start with polyhalogenated starting material. And usually these are very expensive. How do we predict which halogen will undergo oxidative addition first? Is that a good way to, 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 to predict this? Is that actually find it out by try and error? So we learn from school or from literature, oxygen addiction will usually faster with aldehyde than bromide, than chloride. Now look at this substrate. Is this applicable? To it. Well, we learn, we usually check with QM calculation. First, we look at the lumo. Since there's no lumo loop on the carbon next to the bromide, palladium zero, which is functionally a leucophile, it will not insert into the bromide. Then our question turns into is which of the chloride it will insert into first. Now since lumo loop on the carbon next to the two chloride are similar, we don't have a good way to differentiate by looking at lumo. We learn also a trick is by calculating infrared. Everything like this I calculate. We think about it before even buy stock the material or order the material from our stock room. The C chloride bond indicated with green in color have lower wave number of 1098. Indicated that carbon chloride bond is a weaker one. As such, we observe Suzuki coupling selectively at this position. With the resulting intermediate, we need to run another plane reaction. I'll give you opportunity to look at the number and the lumo of this intermediate and let you predict what will happen. Would it be on the chloride or on the bromide? Yes, you are right. The next palladium reaction is selectively on the chloride. The carbon bromide bond here is still the stronger one. Example six. Here is an HIV integrase inhibitor critical candidate. The question is as I was trying to scale up this compound in an alternative route, is can we selectively ventilate the ring nitrogen without touching the exocytic amide nitrogen? We learn from experience to calculate the electrostatic potential map for this purpose. And we learn that if there is a difference of 30 kJ per mole, between the two acidic protons, the higher one will be selectively deprotonated and then alkylate. And indeed, it proceeds as predicted. Example seven, this was one of those outstanding problems in antibodies, drug conjugation, for oncology use. 216 are entering into the antibody to link to a payload with a file displacement reaction. 
Judge Whiteside team in Harvard used PKA of the file to guide them to optimize their outgroup from pyridine to pyridine to the nitro pyridine, improving the drop antibody ratio from 0 to 0.6. But this is far from 2.0 because there are two cysteine on the antibody that we need. In our lab, we observe much better conjugation with benzothiazole, benzoxazole, and benzimidazole file as a leaving group. Yet the corresponding file alcohol are not more acidic than the nitropyldal analog. How do we explain this? First, Let's look at the number of the nitropyridine disulfide. There is hardly any lumo loop on the sulfur that we want to attack. On the other hand, the significant bigger loop on the desired sulfur with the imidazole. You could imagine we calculate based on this principle lumo of many other potential living group connecting in this manner. And we identify this event sulfana group to have the biggest possible loop on the desired sulfur. That translated to the need of getting or preparing carbon four, as indicated here. This should be a very important region for us. The nitrophenyl carbonate is for connection to the payload. Those toxic compounds for treatment of cancer. The methane sulfonyl side is for conjugation to the antibody with the cysteine on it. We were surprised that the compound is not reported in the literature. The most obvious way for us to prepare it could be by reacting file number two with methane sulfonyl chloride. But we could only isolate the disulfide of two in oxidation product. This is probably why compound four is not reported in the literature. We repeat direction very carefully, purging away all the oxygen that could potentially oxidize to the corresponding disulfide with nitrogen and other one with argon. But we were still observing formation of the disulfide. Then we recognized we were packing up the right tree. It's a hidden success which could be readily interpreted as a total failure. We reasoned that compound three form is actually more reactive than the methane sulfonyl chloride. As such, when it is formed, it reacts with file two to form regional selectively the disulfide we observe. And hence, here, file react with defense of one alkaline from phi, and file two also mimic the cysteine onto the antibody, forming the disulfide bond that we need in the conjugation. Based on all this insight, our team persists and find a way to prepare for. Here, we are very happy to see that we could achieve a drug antibody ratio with the defense sulfonyl compound that is linked to the toxin with a drug antibody ratio of 1.9, close to the theoretical limit of 2.0. 
This example shows us the importance of using the right parameters to guide our analysis and thinking. PKA is an empirical number to think about how good is a living group. We have to go beyond this. Example eight. Usually, we organic chemists can hydrolyze an ester on a same molecule in the presence of nitro a lot faster. As such, we expect when we treat this compound, shown here, for the nitro and ester group with one equivalent of lithium hydroxide to form the acid. But our chemists could only observe hydrolysis, pro hydrolysis product of the nitro, not on the ester. Calculation revealed to us that no lumo loop on the ester carbonyl carbon, only the nitro group. We could have predictors. It is one of the many, many examples. We observe relative reactivity of functional groups at attenuate, and it's not easy to predict so in an intuitive manner. And it's worth checking with quantum mechanics, just a few minutes of calculation. Example nine. When I was a young PhD at Merck, I mentioned to my boss my plan to mix the sulfonamide target as shown here on the top right, because the corresponding carbonyl analog, the amide one, is quite potent. He told me that this reaction will not work. I go back and spend the next two days trying many conditions. And indeed, I could not observe any of the product. With quantum mechanics, I understand why. Lumo show no loops on the carbon connecting to the bromide. A very small loop on the Lumo plus one, which could hardly extend beyond the surface of the molecule for the reaction to proceed. It explains why there's only one example in the literature and no one could reproduce. I hope there's a journal of fair direction to have this report and we do not need to keep doing this kind of reaction one after the other one. Our experience suggests to us that extrapolating properties of the reactions to transition state are valid in organic chemistry in most situations. However, we also learned that if the energy difference is small between the competing pathway, we have to dig a little bit deeper. Example 10, here we will need to predict the visual reactivity of alkylation of this pyrazo ester. So one of our colleagues think if we can compare the PKA by calculating the electron potential map of the totomeric NH compound, We'll know which one is more acidic, and then as such, which nitrogen will be alkali. I suggest we should calculate the homo of the ni, because once it is deprotonated, unlike in the previous case, the charge will delocalize into the ring, and we should look at the in line of this pyrosol. In this case, it shows us that the homo loop 
on both nitrogen are roughly the same size. We could not at this stage or using this information to tell whether there were difference in which nitrogen it will alkylate. We have been taught at school to use A values and empirical way to predict this. FOMO and the group will have A value of 0 0.38 and 1.27 respectively. Bigger the number, larger the size of the group. As such, we will have predict alkylation on the nitrogen next to the bromide to be the major product. And we'll see that this is wrong. Computer is not fast enough for us to model the alkylation. It is by pushing the methyl bromide towards the pyrrhosol anion from 3.8 Amstron to 1.9 Amstron with 0.1 Amstron in each step for each calculation. As shown here, calculation on the exercise of a calculated activation energy of about 9.2 kilocalorie per mole. But 10.77 if we approach on the bromine side. A difference of only 1.5 kilocalorie per mole, which physical organic chemistry taught us a very simple equation. We translate to prediction of 10 to 1 on the side of the ester that is to the molecule on the left-hand side. And indeed, this is the activity that we observe in our experiments. QN make the right prediction. The empirical way that we learn at school fail. For our department and our company, QM calculation have become a essential analytical tool for analysis, prediction, and quantification. It provides us unprecedented insight to our observation and enable us to generate better ideas to solve our problem, teaching us why certain reactions are not achievable. Such analysis, such frontier optical calculation, incorporate electronic and steric effect, and we do not need to bother anymore with all those empirical parameters. And we have decent way to model reaction coordinate, to compete, to compare competing reaction when reaction difference but energy involved are smaller than usual. Quantum mechanics enable us to build strong intuitions and knowing when to check our assumptions. Finally, I would like to acknowledge every member of the department for teaching me every day new reactions, interesting observations and also for their effort in learning and analyzing chemistry with an orbital approach. Their intellectual curiosity, creativity, persistence, and hard work make the slide or the content that I present today possible. Quantum mechanics on the orbital is not intuitive. Same is reality, not intimately easy for us to understand. With that, I thank everyone for uh, calling in for this webinar.
which uh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you very much, John, for a very wonderful uh, and detailed, uh, insightful uh, presentation. We have uh, a few questions here. Uh, the first question is very basic, actually. It's like, basically, how do you calculate the HOMO and LUMO? Uh, what software do you use? Okay. So, uh, we use, because we are mostly, we are all organic chemists. So, we choose to use Spartan 18, uh, moving a very nice uh, graphic user interface uh, to calculate all this homo luma. And you can download this from wave function uh, uh, for a 30 days free trial and learn how to use it. And once you draw the molecule, uh, you set up the choose uh, to calculate the structure Homo Lumo uh, fall out from the calculation of the structure. It comes along with the energy minimization of the structure. Actually, you do not need to do anything in order to calculate the Homo Lumo. After you calculate the structure, Numo and Homo will come along with it. Okay. John, this is another question here asking what's the minimum level a theory that will generate reliable enough results for reaction prediction. And the reason why uh, I recall in your talk, you said uh, in some cases you had to map in the C13 calculate, uh, calculation into, into uh, accurate prediction. So that's a very, that's okay. a very, very relevant question. In a way. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we standardized our calculation within uh, the department, within the company. We use a density function theory with a basic set of six dash thirty one star for most of our calculation. If the compound involves iodine, then we use one level up higher for the basic set. We use six dash thirty one one star. And every mile uh, you just mentioned are uh, being sent after the calculated structure into an algorithm to generate it. Okay, uh, there's another question here. It says here, uh, do you, do you, uh, let's see, do you do any machine learning for prediction? In other words, uh, uh, are you accumulating this information then using the information to make further predictions? So, machine learning not yeah. in my not in the wuxi team too because as i see as i learn about uh, the way that i use quantum mechanics it's not just the number uh, of homo lumo that matters i find out that often the time molecules do not use homo to react it could use homo minus one it could use NUMO plus one. I do not have opportunity to show you this example uh, in this webinar. But when you analyze uh, at the psychic system, it actually happens a lot, very often. And also, as you can see, it's not just the number of the energy, it's actually where the loop stands. So it requires not just training, in machine learning with number, it requires a three-dimensional method to do machine learning. And recently, uh, I'm being brought to attention of a poster uh, presented by uh, Elsevier, in which they use a three-dimensional way to do machine learning of quantum mechanic data of reaction of the uh, compound that they are interesting. So I think eventually it is teaching computer all kind of quantum mechanic data and have it correlate with direction. I think that will be the future of uh, machine learning in chemistry. 
we need to teach the computer quantum mechanics with a lot of parameters than what we currently read in the literature. Those are not sufficient to help us to predict reactivity. Uh, John, we have a question from the audience regarding um, the uh, palladium. So you had a palladium chemistry where you were uh, uh, inserting and discriminating between two chlorines. They use wave numbers, is, uh, is, as it was reported, yeah? And yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, to determine which, which, so it's not a homo lumo per se, it's yet another dimension to predict whether or not insertion would take place. Could you just comment on that further, please? Can you repeat it again? Just so. Oh, oh, can you comment on that further? It? Yes. Oh, I see. The, the wave number. So, hmm? the wave number. So, after the structure is being calculated with quantum mechanics, uh, in some calculation, you can ask it to continue to calculate for uh, infrared. And then, after the output generate, we look at the structure. Uh, we check for this uh, wave, the striking frequency of the carbon halogen bond, and that's how we assign uh, the numbers to that bond. It takes some experience to to do that, but once you get a hand to it, it's actually relatively easy. Have you extended that into uh, carbon hydrogen in you know insertions? Or no or is carbon just, hydrogen you know, is, okay. Yeah. We're able to Go analyze on. some of this actually with LUMO but not uh, not with IR. Okay. We have some uh, we uh, we have a question here from uh, from the uh, member of the audience who said you didn't get the name of the software. The software oh. for the I think he's referring to Spartan. So you would just talk about that for a minute again. Yes, called Spartan. S P A R T A N. Spartan 18 by a company called Wave Function. Okay, and there's one more question that says. Uh, do, uh, do, do you evaluate the effects of pH and temperature on the homo lumo gap? pH and well, temperature. So, now of course, uh, you mentioned about pH. There's something that we have to be very be conscious about. Uh, when we calculate something, we're calculating should be a canine, a neutral species, or a anodic species. So uh, that is the pH component. Temperature, our experience for that we, we, we don't actually, uh, we don't see a difference, or maybe the temperature required for the reaction are shown in the gap of it. We actually we do not change uh, the temperature for the calculation. Okay. My point is the right, then... difference is, is enough for us to gauge whether the reaction will proceed or not. Okay. So uh, I think I don't I don't see any more questions at this point. Uh, so we'd like to thank the uh, the participants, the audience, for uh, for bearing for the last uh, let's say 45 minutes or so, 50 minutes with us, and uh, we certainly thank John for his very insightful uh, lecture and webinar, and uh, and we welcome you to uh, to another one in the future. And if there's any feedback you can give us, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, and th and that can be that can be done. Uh, let's see what I say it was. It was. Uh, it was uh where was that? Uh, it's I was I do I can't find it now. It's terrible. Uh, you can you can give us feedback uh uh at, at your leisure and uh, we'd like to hear back from you uh if if uh if you if you uh, have further comments.
So with that, I'd just like to thank everybody for your time and your efforts, and uh, we look forward to uh, future discussions. Thank you very much, everybody. So long. Thank you.